let's create an advanced item in Minecraft 116.5 by extending the item class. So the item we're creating is called a Firestone. And I'm going to quickly explain the idea. It's actually quite important to have a good idea on what you want to do with your advanced item beforehand. So don't just go in and start programming. Actually take a few minutes to think of an idea of what this item should do. So the idea of the Firestone is that you can right click a block and you can use it eight times before it breaks. 50% of the time when you right click a block, doesn't matter what block it is, you're lit on fire. The other 50% of the time, if it is a correct block, in our case we're going to make it obsidian, but this would be expandable, then you gain fire resistance for 10 seconds. That is if you're not on fire. And if you click the wrong block, then you simply light the ground on fire. Now at first this might seem a little confusing, but once we've coded it in, you're going to see that the code is actually really easy to follow. I'll be trying to code this in the cleanest manner that I can. Let's move on to creating the item. Instead of just making a new registry object in our mod items class, we're actually going to create a new class. I'm personally going to put this in a new package called custom under the item package. This is definitely optional because package management really is something that you and if you have a team, your team need to be concerned with and not really anyone else. So as long as you have an overview, it's totally fine. So instead of the new package, if you also want to do that, we're going to create a new Java class called Firestone. And this Firestone class we're going to extend by item. And once again, making sure that we use netminecraft.item here. Then you will see the red underlines here. We're just going to hover over it and then click create constructor matching super. And then no more errors are going to be present here. And now the big question is how can we implement advanced features into items? We can actually do this by overwriting methods from the item class in the iForge item interface. To actually view the methods that we can override, we can simply navigate our cursor here to the item and middle mouse button click, and then the item class will open. And then as you can see, all of those methods basically can be overridden. Everything that is public or protected and private stuff cannot be overridden. If you navigate back to the top and then scroll to the right here, you can see the iForge item. We can also middle mouse button click on here. And there are a few more methods basically added by Forge that we can also overwrite. And the other thing that you can do inside of the class, you can write in overwrite. And then as you can see, these are all of the methods that I might be able to overwrite here. As you can see, there is a lot of stuff in here and it might take a while to really get used to what methods need to be used at what time. In our case, we're going to use the on item use first method. And what we can do is also we can basically middle mouse button click and then we can see everywhere where it has been used or where it has been referenced. Now I know that this is a method from the iForge item interface. So we can basically go in here and take a look. There we go on item use first. And usually there's a nice description of it. So as you can see, this is called when the item is used before the block is activated. So this method is called when we right click a block and whatever code we put in here is executed before any right click functionality on the block is executed. So the first thing that we're going to do in this method is we're going to make a new world variable and this is going to be equal to context.getWorld. The item used context parameter here is really useful because it contains a lot of fields. For example, as you can see, it contains the possible player, the hand, even a ray trace result, the world and the item stack that uh, right, it was right clicked. So the reason we need the world is because we need to ask whether or not the world is remote or not. And we only want to execute the code if the world is a not remote. This simply ensures that we are on the server so that the code gets only executed on the server thread. For the time being, without getting into too much detail, basically we only want the server to execute code if we, for example, spawn items or change blocks in the world. So certain things that the client should not be allowed to do. In the future, I will add a comprehensive explanation for the client server architecture of Minecraft. But for the time being, this should be enough. Now we're going to add a few more variables inside of here. So one thing is going to be the player entity. We can get that by using context.getPlayer. And then we'll also take the block state, which is the click block. And we can get this by getting world.getBlockState context.getPass. So the world.getBlock state returns the instance of the block that was clicked. This is called a block state at the specific position that we get through the item use context. And then afterwards, we want our logic to happen. For that, we're actually going to make a new method. So this is going to be the right click on certain block state method with click block, the context and the player entity given as parameters. We can right click this, show context actions, and then simply make create a method in a block state. And then it creates a method for us automatically. We'll just change the formatting. There you go. And we also want to damage the item that we're holding. So this would be the stack. So this, so an item stack similar to a block state is the specific instance of that item. And then we're going to do stack 
dot damage item with the amount one, giving the player entity, and then we're gonna say player player dot send break animation with context dot get hand. Now player entity will light up for you, and this is because argument might be null. Now in this case, the player entity should never be null. However, we can add an assert here, or what we can also do when we assign the player up here, we can actually write objects dot require non null and put this in here. And then this will no longer light up, basically ensuring that the player entity is not null. And if it is, then we'll get an exception thrown right here. Right now onto the right click on certain block states method. What do we want to do here? Well, in there, we actually want the logic to go. Let's think about this. So we've said that 50% of the time, we want the player to just be lit on fire. So we're going to say random dot next float is bigger than 0.5f. And then basically, we're just going to put in a comment for now, light player on fire. And we're going to add the code for that after we've done the if statement. And there's another if statement, of course. So if you hit the other 50% of the time, we're basically asking, okay, if the player is not on fire and we're clicking the correct block, then we want to gain the fire resistance. A player is not on fire can be done with unequals player entity dot is burning, but I really don't like this. So personally, I'm going to make a new variable up here, which is going to be called player is not on fire. And we're going to simply set this equal to this. And then we're going to take the player is not on fire and put that in the if statement. I think that player is not on fire is more understandable in this case than unequals player entity dot is burning. And then we somehow need to ask for whether or not a block is valid. Now we're just going to write in block is a valid for, for resistance and pass in the clicked block. So the block state in this case, and we're going to make a new method for this as well. Great method block is valid for resistance. And we're simply going to return click block dot get block is equal to block start obsidian. So this will simply return true when the click block is obsidian and it will click and it will return false if the block is anything else. You can expand this by using the or operator in this case. So we can say click block dot get block is equal to blocks dot netherrack, for example. And then the valid blocks would be obsidian and netherrack. For two, three, maybe even four blocks, this is fine. However, if you want to use more blocks in this case, I would definitely advise to use a set of blocks, a set is similar to a list where every item can only be entered once. Right, if this is the case, what happens then? Well, then we'll gain fire resistance and uh, we'll destroy the block. For now, only as a comment, we'll add that as well. And then else, so this would be if either the player is on fire or it is not a valid block. If either one of those is false, then we'll simply uh, light the ground on fire. And this is the entire logic that we want. And now we basically want to create methods for each of those cases. So we'll definitely make some of those public and static. So maybe lighting the player on fire is something that we want to do a lot in our mod. So then it makes sense to instead of instead of re-implementing this, we can basically always call this from the Firestone. So public static void light entity on fire. Then we'll give it an entity. So entity entity and an integer seconds how long this entity should be on fire. Import the entity by pressing Alt Enter and then Enter. We're gonna import entity net Minecraft entity and then we will call entity dot set fire with the seconds given. And then instead of having the comment here, we can already call light entity on fire with the player entity and let's say six seconds. The next thing would be to gain the fire resistance and destroy a block. We're gonna do this in a private method, private void gain fire resistance and destroy block. This will need the player, so player entity, player entity. We'll also need the world and we're also going to need the block pass. So basically the position that we clicked. So let's import block pass as well. Now the reason I'm making this private is because this is a very specific thing that we're doing and I'd rather make a public static void method of gain fire resistance for the player entity player entity simply because gaining fire resistance and then destroying a block is very specific to the firestone so the more specific you get the more likely it is that you can make it private or that you can make it non-static how do you gain fire resistance so player entity dot add potion effect new effect instance and then we'll give it effects dot fire resistance and then 200. The duration here is in a ticks. So simply divide this by 20 and then you get the number of seconds. This is also how you add a potion effect. It's actually fairly easy to do. And then let's call this method gain fire resistance layer entity. And then you also want to destroy the block. And we can do this by doing world dot destroy block at position and then false because we don't want the block to drop. Right now, instead of the comment, let's call this. So gain fire resistance and destroy block with the player entity with the world. So this is going to be context dot get world and then context.getPass. And now the last thing is to light the ground on fire. We'll make a new method for that as well. So this is going to be public 
static void light ground on fire with the actually the item use context in this case context and instead of writing this ourselves we can actually think well is there an item that already does this and of course there is that's flint and steel so you can press Control shift f to put the file menu up uh, click scope and then and then search for flint and steel somewhere you will find the class so we can basically double click this and then the flint and steel item class will open as you can see the on item use method called when an item is used when targeting a block so as you can see this is the implementation on how the right clicking for the flint and steel item works and for the time being we can actually basically copy everything in here and put it in there but then you will first of all find that a few things are going to be read because in this method we're only we don't return anything so we can get rid of the returns as well as up here we're actually taking a look at whether or not a campfire block can be lit this doesn't actually matter to us we're only worried whether or not we can light the block itself so we basically are going to take this if statement cut it out and then all of this can be gone We'll get a few red spots in here, but no worries, because what we will do is this block pass can simply be renamed to block pass. And then this, instead of just taking the pass, we want to do offset context.getFace. We also don't need to damage the item, so this can also go. And then as you can see, the item stack can go as well. The only things that we're going to do is we're going to play the sound and we'll get the block state where we can place the item. This we can also rename to just block state. And then it's a very easy to look at method. Learning what you can delete and what you can't delete is just something that you need to learn over time. This doesn't just fall out of the sky. You will just have to try out a lot of things. And the more Java you understand, the easier it gets as well. But then instead of the comment here, we can also call the light ground on fire method with the context here. And then our class is actually done. Once again, the reason why some of the methods are public and static is because maybe we want to reuse them later time in our code somewhere else. And there even is a good argument of basically not putting them in the Firestone class, but maybe putting them into some sort of util class. If we were to make a mod all about fire and, and maybe fire magic and things like that, then a really good idea would be to have sort of a fire util class where you have a lot of static methods like light entity on fire to gain fire resistance or maybe even firing fire charges, something like that. But for the time being, we'll keep it in the Firestone, but that's definitely something that you can think about. Right, now that we've done the functionality, we can now finally go into our mod items and create the new item. We're simply going to copy this here, the ameth amethyst. We're going to say Firestone, and then the name is going to be Firestone. And then instead of creating a new item, we're going to make a new Firestone. And something very crucial we need to add is the max damage. This will be 8 because we basically only have eight uses on those items. That's what we said in the beginning, so that the Firestone isn't this crazy overpowered item. Now let's not forget the item model class. So new file, firestone.json. And for convenience, I will simply copy this over. This is of course available as a download in the description below. Oh, I almost forgot. We also need the texture. It's of course, also available for a download. And now let's see what the Firestone does. All right, and we find ourselves in Minecraft. And as you can see, the Firestone has been added to the game. And as you can see, it is just not localized, but that's of course something that we can easily fix later. Now let's actually see if the functionality works. So if I right click the Obsidian block, and as you can see, we have now hit the 50% uh, where I am actually getting lit on fire. Let's see if we have more luck now. And we have not had more luck now. Let's actually do it again. And there we go. Now we actually have fire resistance here. And this is for 10 seconds. You can also see every right click, the item gets damaged more and more. Now we don't have any fire resistance anymore. If we click a block that's not valid, then the ground is lit on fire. Or of course, we can still be lit on fire regardless of the block we click. Right, and as you can see, an advanced item is very much more complex than just adding a new ingot or a block that doesn't really do much. So you really need to plan out what advanced items do before you add them into your mod. And the more complex the functionality, the more complex the item class will be and the more complex the code needs to be. Also remember to always keep your code as clean as you can so that it is expandable and easily maintainable, especially if you're working with multiple people. And when it comes to other advanced functionality, it's really just a matter of time and a matter of testing things out. So you must be willing to experiment a little bit uh, on your own and simply try out a lot of things you're trying to do something and you're not really getting anywhere you can also join my discord server 
There's a link down in the description below. And there's a channel where I and a few other people can help you if you've started already. But the more advanced you go, the less likely it is someone else has already done it. So just be aware of that. Apart from that, I'm hoping that you're already starting to plan your own custom advanced item. If you want to check out the code, the GitHub repository is of course linked in the description below. And if you like this video and you learned something new, of course, don't forget to smash that like button and I will see you in the next video. So yeah.